Welcome back. First and foremost, we've hit 16,000 subscribers going on to 17, and I couldn't be more happy about that. Honestly, it feels like a gift to be able to share my ideas and my findings with you and to have you give me your support and your contributions and your new ideas on each and every video. It is greatly appreciated. Now, in a previous video, we discussed the epitome of what I consider to be the old world, something with massive Romanesque architecture, and that is the Hagia Sophia. That building, which dates back to the Byzantine Empire, has been many things throughout its hundreds of years, including beginning as a Catholic cathedral, but then transforming into a mosque, and in the 20th century, it was a high-end museum full of priceless artifacts. What's more interesting is after the events of 2020, this monumental building, the Hagia Sophia, was actually reverted back into a mosque, leaving many of us to question where all of the priceless artifacts have gone. But that's for another video, and if you'd like, you can check out my video on the Hagia Sophia after this one. I only bring that up because in today's video, I would like to discuss the Cathedral of St. Domnias in modern-day split Croatia. The Cathedral of St. Domnias is the oldest Catholic cathedral in the world that remains in use as its original structure, without any significant renovations or rebuilds. Essentially, this is the oldest Catholic church in the world which has continually operated as a Catholic church up until and through today. It's absolutely fascinating when you come to find out that the Cathedral of St. Domnias was consecrated the whole way back in the early 7th century. However, when we dive into the current narrative history even further, things become even more interesting. First, the Cathedral of St. Domnias is an inherited building. I believe that this is the proper place to start this discussion. While it was consecrated in the 7th century, this massive complex of structures which makes up the cathedral and the adjacent buildings is actually dated much further back to the year of 305. The original superstructure which once incorporated today's cathedral was known back then as the Mausoleum of Diocletian. This leads us to some really interesting additional layers which we can try to decipher and unpack. First, we have this Roman superstructure, which itself was said to be built for Diocletian to retire to. Diocletian was the Roman emperor, ruling from roughly 284 until 305. He was born and raised in ancient Salona, capital of the Roman province of Dalmatia, and located pretty much where modern-day split Croatia is today. Now, it is written that Diocletian was the Roman emperor who stabilized the kingdom and brought a time of peace and prosperity. Yet also according to the same narrative, the mausoleum of Diocletian and the structure was built in our favorite way as a defensive fortified city, aka something like a star fort. Now I use the term star fort loosely here, as with these older structures, while many of them are symmetrical, they do not always resemble stars per se. It's more a term of understanding the questionable or advanced purposes that these structures could have served. In modern times, roughly half of the old town of Split, Croatia, exists within the ancient walls of this mausoleum of Diocletian, and this becomes even more spectacular when we realize that in modern times and current times, what we see in Split Croatia is only a mere portion of the mausoleum or the fortified city which once stood here. To imagine how large the original mausoleum of Diocletian really was is quite a dumbfounding thought indeed. Currently, we have many massive buildings which reside in the premises of the mausoleum's current walls. Yet roughly 1,700 years ago, there were even larger buildings that stood here with even larger walls that encompassed even more of this city. It's absolutely fascinating. Now, that brings me to another interesting topic that I've heard being discussed 
recently especially in regards to these massive old world walled cities all of these fortified cities now we're told that they were built to be defensive and other people like to make the argument that they served a more esoteric purpose and i like to weigh all different aspects of the narrative i like to have an open mind to all different ideas that they could be but one i've heard lately is simply that these massive walls that these fortified cities were basically to control who got in and who got out of the city but not just people also trade basically this was a way for those in power for those who controlled the cities to monitor what was going in and coming out of the city and to make sure that they got their cut this was a way to basically control the people within the city in modern times, we don't see things like this because we don't necessarily need the walls, but we do have different aspects of society and culture that basically keep us walled in at all times. But back then, what if these walls were simply to control the people? Now, I know that's a very basic idea, but one that I just thought was worth weighing here. Now, diving back into this narrative, we are told that this massive fortified town this mausoleum city was created for Diocletian to retire to. Now we have a very interesting history when we look at Diocletian and we look at the area of Dalmatia in general. Now Dalmatia was an ancient Roman province and one thing you're probably wondering right off the bat, yes, the Dalmatian dog, that name comes from the ancient region of Dalmatia. Dalmatian dogs were said to be ancient hunting dogs but eventually became more well known around the world as carriage dogs as they were often seen guiding the horses through the streets and they would alert passerbys basically to move out of the way. Essentially, we are told Dalmatian dogs are said to have been roughly the size of the largest Great Danes at one point and they may have actually come from the Great Dane species. But I digress. Dalmatia, the Roman province, was earlier known as Illyria. And if that sounds familiar, it should. Illyria was a key component in both ancient Roman and Greek mythology, with the Delmatae being one of the most feared and well-known tribes of the Illyrians. Eventually, after Roman conquest of the modern world at the time, Romans began to refer to those from the Illyrian region by the name of their most famous tribe, the Delmatae, name formed the basis for the name Dalmatia or Dalmatia. Now here's just another interesting angle to look at these things and I'm going to try and tie it all together then but this cathedral and this mausoleum are said to have had a bewildering amount of interior or underground domes. The mausoleum of Diocletian also has some very interesting wordplay when we read into this narrative a bit. We always seem to point our fingers, so to speak, when a name is befitting of the narrative that it's given, almost like a tongue-in-cheek reference or a clue by those in the know. Now, this oldest continually used cathedral, which like I said, is full of domes, or at the least at one point, the mausoleum from which it was consecrated was full of domes, both interior and exterior, is known today as the Cathedral of St. Domnius. Now, call it a simple way of viewing history, but I always think it's very interesting when we have names like this that fit the narrative. Obviously, the name Domnius could have been more common back then, but when I do a simple Google search, every basic reference of the name Domnius ties back strictly to this narrative. Domnius was a Christian living in the Roman city of Salona, capital of Dalmatia. By the third century, Domnius became the bishop of this capital city of Salonia, Dalmatia. At the same time, Diocletian, from a poor family in Salona, somehow rises to power to become the Roman emperor. Diocletian then goes on a persecution rampage against Christians, and Domnius, alongside seven other Christians, is executed at the fort in Salonia in 304. The construction of Diocletian's walled mausoleum fort is then completed by 305. However, within 300 years of the completion of Diocletian's mausoleum, Rome has essentially fallen, the Christian Roman Catholic Church has risen, and Diocletian's mausoleum is said to have been greatly diminished besides the main buildings at its center, 
which we are discussing today. And one of these buildings remaining from the mausoleum of Diocletian would go on to basically be consecrated or renamed the Cathedral of St. Domnius. And it's named after Domnius, who was actually executed by Diocletian all around the same time period. So this is just really interesting history. It's very convoluted when you read into it. It's very interesting when you come to find that this entire city surrounding the mausoleum and surrounding this cathedral were all a massive fortified walled city. And furthermore, this cathedral, which by itself is so well known for being the oldest continually operating cathedral in the entire world that a lot of people seem to forget the even older aspects of this cathedral. It really does have history that goes back much further than we give it credit for. And even when we look at the Roman Empire, we have to wonder exactly how this mausoleum, how this fortified city really popped up and really was so large and so massive that it became the center of the entire province of Dalmatia. So I just thought I would share that with you. Hopefully that brings the narrative full circle for you. So hopefully that was really interesting to you. Uh, a few more aspects I wanted to point out is that we're told that none of these buildings were ever rebuilt. Essentially what we have here is this Cathedral of St. Domnius. It remains the oldest continually used cathedral in the world because it was never rebuilt. So when we take that fact into consideration, we also must consider that none of the buildings here within the mausoleum or fort are said to have been rebuilt. So what we're looking at are essentially the designs of Diocletian from the year of 305. And we are somehow led to believe that within Diocletian's defensive retirement fort design was a building that resembled or looked exactly like a cathedral. And it was able to be basically transformed into a cathedral without being rebuilt or redesigned. And I think that's absolutely fascinating here. And another aspect that I just wanted to point out is that we are told this bell tower that accompanies the cathedral was built in the early 12th century. But even understanding these dates, we have to take them with a bit of salt. I think what more people need to focus on here are the layers of history when we look in locations like this. When we unwrap the narrative, it becomes easy to see where facts and fiction may have become combined. We have this bell tower being credited as created in the year 1100, roughly. But it is built using the exact same limestone and construction style of the original massive mausoleum. Basically what we're told, because we're told the mausoleum was never rebuilt, it was never touched. So if you think that all of these buildings look identical in all of these photographs, or they look like they were built at the same time period, well, you would be wrong because many of these pictures were looking at a tower that was said to be built in the year 1100. We are told the exact same architectural style and even the exact same limestone quarry were used. It's all a very convoluted history. We're basically told 800 years passed, and then the same architects or the same family of architects went to the same exact quarry that the mausoleum was built out of, and they quarried the exact same limestone, and they built this tower in the exact same style as the rest of the mausoleum. There's no way, according to the current narrative, that this tower could predate 1100 or that the tower was part of the original mausoleum and we're told it was most definitely built in 1100. Now, that becomes even more interesting because this is a bell tower and it was built during the time period which for many people falls within the phantom timeline. But to describe it more simply, it falls in the timeline after Rome had fallen for a long period of time where we don't see Romanesque architecture being used. However, we do have a few anomalies like this tower, which are said to have somehow been built in the Roman architecture style, even though all of those architectural designs and basically the mathematics behind them were said to have been lost.
I believe when we look at old world history, history always tends to repeat itself, and in the case of the Cathedral of St. Domnius, we have one of the most easily identifiable examples. We have a superstructure with little to no written history, massive walls, reinforcements, castles, and even cathedral-like structures with domes and spires, all said to have been built a long time ago, in this case over 1700 years ago, by a dedicated group of seemingly advanced people. Yet, within a few centuries, the advanced people would diminish and their kingdom would fall, and eventually the next inheritors would take their place. These next inheritors would often repurpose, remodel, and rename parts of the superstructure, hiding and erasing the history which didn't fit their design. Most of the time, the inheriting would continue from society to society, from decade to decade. But in the case of St. Domnia's Cathedral, we have the same group who has controlled the history for most of written time. That is the Roman Catholic Church. History is always bound to repeat itself until the truth is really uncovered. Every generation seems to add another layer. But I'm hoping with your continued interest, we can begin to peel back these layers and find some sort of aspect of the truth. The Cathedral of St. Domnius is the oldest continuously operating Catholic cathedral in the entire world. But it is also much more than that. It's a relic of the past. A massive city buried below the surface. A fortified kingdom for a forgotten emperor. An inherited superstructure in a geometric pattern which dates back so far that the proper history can't accurately be deduced. These are all definitions to many locations around the world. And I'm just hoping in today's video about the cathedral and about the mausoleum of Diocletian, you can say that your eyes were opened up a little bit and you learned something. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here. I believe it's absolutely crucial to our history to understand, especially when we want to focus on the old world itself, that for centuries and for millennia, it seems that we've had different cultures that were built on top of the ruins of the culture before them. When we look at the old world, no matter where it is in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, even in Africa, and even in Australia, we can see the ruins of certain cultures, certain massive structures that were built on top of, and eventually the history seems to be convoluted and or retold. And that's what we're looking at in videos like this. I think it's important when we go back as far as we can, especially when we look at Rome, when we look at the 300s, the 400s, the 500s, and the fall of Rome, and how many of those ancient cities and fortifications were either lost and other ones were rebuilt or built on top of and transformed into more modern day cities. This is something that we see going on continuously in different old world narratives. And I believe it points to some version of an ancient advanced culture that may not have particularly been in contact with one another, but they themselves have many aspects of their culture that are related. But I'm just going to digress there. I want to hear your thoughts and comments down below. I also just wanted to say a big thank you because as the channel continues to grow, I'm beginning to find more aspects to add into this video, more different techniques that I can use. And one thing that I've been able to invest in since opening up the channel to donations is a new 4K camera that should be coming very soon. So I'll be able to make new 4K content, new HDR content, and I'll be able to go out on foot and get some really interesting and unique footage. And it's with your help and with your dedication to the channel that that was possible. So I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I also wanted to let you guys know that I have roughly 10 Jared Boosters tees left. So if you wanted one of those, you can hit the donation link down below and I will get in contact with you and we will get you one of those before they are gone. Now, on those lines, I also wanted to give a shout out 
to another five donators. I'm trying to do that in every video, really give a thank you to those of you that have reached out to me and made making these videos even easier and made it possible and given me more free time to do this. So without further ado, a big thank you to Linda Davies, to Jared Oglinski, to David Hoyt, to William Reidenbach, and to Desiree Williams. It's because of you guys that making this content is possible. Now, I've also decided to go ahead and instead of picking one, I've decided to pick two winners. So there are going to be two of you who watched and commented and subscribed to the channel on my 15K special video. And those two of you are each going to be receiving one of these 15K special t-shirts. So I've already reached out to you in the comments, but if you're watching this video at all, Joe Kerr, and Rue Porter. Definitely hit me up and I will get in contact with you and I will get one of these tees sent out to you right away. But for everyone else, all of your continued support means the world to me. A like, a subscribe, you viewing the channel, it means everything. So please share this content, please hit the thumbs up and I will talk to you and see you very soon on the next video. Thank you so much.